So good morning to our U.S. audience. Uh, good evening to our Turkish audience. And we also have a relatively uh, a very large audience in other places as well. Uh, before I begin, I'm just going to give some details on how you can engage with us using uh, on Twitter, uh, at Atlantic Council, or at AC underline Istanbul, and at Turk Heritage. All of those handles we'll be using on, on, on Twitter where we're also gonna be live streaming on various accounts, including my own, Damon Wilson's and the Atlantic Council account. Uh, we're on Zoom, as you know. Uh, we're also going to be on YouTube and LinkedIn uh, on the Council's Facebook page as well. So that's just for the details. Our experience at the Atlantic Council during this period, we're in the fifth week of telework, is uh, we don't use the word social distance around the Atlantic Council, it's physical distance. But we have found that through technology, we've actually brought our global Atlantic Council community closer together, that we're actually more galvanized and closer than we've ever been before. Uh, I couldn't be more honored uh, to be hosting a virtual discussion with His Excellency Mevlut Çavuşoğlu, the Foreign Minister of Turkey. Mr. Mr. Minister, uh, welcome, welcome to the Atlantic Council in a virtual sense. Um, our last public event with His Excellency was for a special town hall at NATO Engages to commemorate the 7th anniversary of NATO in April 2019, which we hosted together with the Munich Security Conference and the German Marshall Fund. We also hosted the minister at a round table in Washington, D.C. last October, the day after a historic White House visit by the Turkish president. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Minister, for agreeing to address our community today. I last saw the minister physically uh, at Turkey, a Turkish house in Davos, just a wonderful innovation this year at the World Economic Forum. Uh, the Atlantic Council's experience in Turkey dates back over 10 years with a presence in Turkey. In the past two years, the council has increased its engagement by launching the Atlantic Council in Turkey program which pursues an ambitious program, I would say even a, a deeper program than we had before, focused on US-Turkey relations, regional security issue, issues, economics, business, and migration. Under uh, Atlantic Council and Turkey director, Defna Aslan's uh, remarkable leadership, and with her terrific team, uh, Pinar and, and Grady, I know you're online as well, it's great to have you leading this charge with us. Uh, but under DEFNA, and thanks to the support and commitment of our partners in Turkey, our programming is continuously deepening and expanding. Over a month ago, I wrote in my CNBC column, Inflection Points, that coronavirus will change the world. Uh, we don't know exactly how yet, but it will have an impact on relationships, on the world order, on globalization, on our economies. Uh, and the Atlantic Council has uh, put, tried to put itself at the forefront of the current impact of COVID-19, but also thinking about the post-COVID-19 world. Uh, the global uh, system itself and globalization is under a unique challenge. Will countries around the world, acknowledging that we are all in this together, unify around this crisis and cooperate? Or will the crisis uh, 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 cause us to uh, hunker down in our national positions. Uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, our longest serving board member, said we have to take on uh, the COVID crisis and build the future simultaneously. And that is certainly what we're trying to do at the Atlantic Council. The title of our event today, what needs to be done now to define the future, fits into this, uh, this rubric. It clearly summarizes our predicament. The question on everyone's minds is what does the future Hold? What impact will this present situation have on that future? What sort of world will it be? And what can we do now to ensure a better, more secure, more collaborative, more cooperative future? We'll also take the uh, opportunity to discuss uh, important regional issues which Turkey is at the center of, including situations around Idlib, 
Libya, the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as always U.S.-Turkish relations. Uh, I'm greatly looking forward to hearing Minister Shavasholu's thoughts and Turkey's perspective. Uh, the minister has been Turkey's Minister of Foreign Affairs for the past six years. We've had the honor of hosting him on several occasions, as I said before. Mr. Minister, I sincerely hope we're going to see each other physically in one geographic position very soon. Uh, as I remarked to a group of Turkish friends earlier this month, I hope to celebrate the end of COVID-19 by traveling to Istanbul and doing one of my favorite things on earth, which is taking a boat ride down the Bosporus. Minister Shavasholu, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, uh, President Kemper, dear uh, Fred, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. It is a real pleasure to address you at this uh, special uh, event. And I would like to thank the Atlantic Council and the Turkish Heritage Organization for inviting me to speak at such a uh, critical uh, juncture. The coronavirus outbreak has been the ultimate uh, stress test for the entire world. It has revealed our uh, vulnerabilities. It has also shown our strengths, actually. We have seen that uh, good governance and effective state capacity matter. Indeed, slow, uh, piecemeal responses, confusing and populist public messaging, uh, and unscientific approaches uh, don't work. The damage to humans is uh, enormous. I extend my uh, sympathies uh, for so many lives uh, that have been uh, lost. This is not the time uh, of lament and do nothing. To the contrary, uh, this is the time for reflection and leadership. What we do today will define uh, tomorrow. There are two alternatives. We will either try to uh, confine ourselves uh, within our borders and negate what we have achieved in the last uh, century, or we will prevail together uh, with more cooperation and solidarity. Individual country uh, responses are not and will, will not be uh, enough. Even wealthy countries are uh, buckling uh, under the uh, pressure. The virus attacks our uh, very core as uh, humanity and community of uh, nations. But we cannot abandon the idea of uh, progress. Like everyone else, Turkey is taking her own measures on health and economy. We started early and benefit from this. Our measures have been guided by a, a scientific council and the steps uh, we have been taken were decisive. President Erdogan also unveiled a relief package to support businesses and uh, households. Turkey has also repatriated more than 25,000 Turkish nationals from over 70 countries and here I would like to thank all those countries for their uh, tremendous assistance. And at my ministry, we establish a coordination and support center operating 24 seven. And now we are prepared to repatriate another around 25,000 uh, nationals uh, from um, more than uh, 50 uh, different uh, countries. I know that many countries are implementing similar measures. However, individual efforts uh, will not be enough a global challenge requires a, a global response. And there are three short-term priorities, public health, economy, and regional conflicts. I will leave the public health and uh, safety uh, to the experts, but the refugees and vulnerable groups shouldn't be uh, forgotten. As the country hosting the largest refugee population uh, with more than 4 million people, we are doing our best uh, to protect vulnerable groups uh, from outbreak. Secondly, we must work together to protect uh, national and global economy and trade. And the challenge uh, concerns global governance. Here, logistics uh, also is very important that we, need, we have been working with many other countries uh, to eliminate all the uh, problems in front of logistics and uh, trade. 
and the global uh, multilateral system is in poor condition, uh, condition, I'm sorry. And the need for reform is greater than ever, but I am not holding my breath. G20 is 80% of the global economy. It is more representative than other formats. In the 2008 economic crisis, the system worked because G20 worked. One can debate whether it is living up to its uh, promise now. It should. We made our contributions by leading the way in forming a coordination mechanism with some members of the G20 initiated by uh, Canada. We need to establish cooperation mechanisms among similar centers uh, to assist each other and uh, resolve uh, common uh, issues. Last Friday, uh, the leaders of Turkic Council had an extraordinary summit in a video conference to discuss uh, challenges uh, related to uh, coronavirus. As MICDA foreign ministers, I mean Mexico, Indonesia, Republic of Korea, uh, Turkey, and Australia, we, this is another group uh, within the G20, we release a joint statement underlining the importance of uh, robust uh, international uh, cooperation. We also call the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Executive Committee for an extraordinary video conference meeting at the level of uh, foreign ministers. It might happen uh, next uh, week. COVID response was also the uh, central theme of the NATO ministerial of uh, two weeks ago. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, last but not least, the coronavirus pandemic dramatically affects uh, regions uh, in conflict. It also poses a great threat uh, to fragile states. That will harm all of us. We estimate that there will be more states facing fragility and possibly even conflict and collapse. The pandemic disrupts humanitarian aid flow and uh, diverts attention from the conflict uh, prevention but it must also disrupt proxy wars and geopolitical conflicts. It must end all policies that weaken uh, nation states. We need a, a rules-based network of strong, resilient, and accountable nation states. No one will win, but everyone will lose if the current conflicts in the Middle East uh, continue. Special attention to Africa is also essential. Uh, that is why in an article at Washington Times, I call on the international community to step down in all conflicts and cease uh, hostilities. This wouldn't be possible in a uh, piecemeal fashion. What we need is a grand bargain and decisive uh, action. On our part, we will continue with our enterprising and humanitarian foreign policy. We will keep working for a political solution in Syria and supporting the call for a humanitarian truce in Libya. Turning inwards won't work. So far, we extended a helping hand to 34 countries, including some of our key allies like UK, Italy, and Spain, but also uh, others. This is in spite, the, in spite of the fact that we are also uh, in need of uh, medical uh, equipment. And we don't make the aid effort based on political considerations. That is why we also granted or offered uh, exceptional export permits to the countries that uh, we have uh, strained uh, relations. Ladies and gentlemen, a global effort is needed. And what we do today to make global governance work and multilateral cooperation work will define uh, tomorrow. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, uh, now I look forward to uh, ha having your questions and I'll do my best uh, to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And uh, I would like to welcome you uh, again uh, as director of the Atlantic Council's Turkey program. It's an honor to have you here today. Uh, so without uh, any delay, I like to continue with our questions and maybe go to more specific, especially on uh, Turkey's uh, coronavirus aid efforts. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Minister, we would like to start with the latest developments on COVID-19. Could you please shortly summarize how Turkey approached and is approaching to the outbreak? Could you briefly outline what Turkey has done to combat the spread of the virus and what role has Turkey played in receiving and offering assistance? Thank you, Mr. Minister. Well, let me first share some figures. Uh, already uh, more than 400,000 tests and we have uh, around 61,000 uh, cases and uh, the death uh, is 1,296 and uh, almost 4,000 recovered. And we took, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, we took the pandemic serious uh, from uh, early on and adapted strict measures. And we follow the guidelines of the uh, WHO and all measures are updated based on the scientific uh, data and the advice of the scientific board that I mentioned in my opening remarks again. And we are increasing testing capacity and uh, more than uh, 400,000 as I just uh, mentioned, and we will reach uh, half a million soon. And we introduce uh, strict traveling restrictions, suspended all uh, international flights, banned and uh, banned all travel uh, to and from uh, major cities. I mean, 31 major cities in, in Turkey and close land borders with uh, some neighbors for uh, human passage. However, uh, goods are moving uh, freely, facing sometimes some challenges there as well, but we are overcoming them. And those returning from abroad that I'm, I share the figures with you abroad are put under compulsory uh, quarantine for 14 days in special dormitories. You know, universities and dormitories are closed right now, and we take the advantage of that and putting those people in quarantine in those dormitories. And schools, universities, and places of large gatherings are closed, and we introduce a curfew for people under 20 and over 65. And we began imposing a general curfew on weekends, last time, first time, and it will continue, it seems, uh, the upcoming weekend as well. And public employees are working in shifts, including at my uh, ministry, and wearing a mask in markets and bazaars uh, became mandatory. Actually, we had banned the sales of uh, masks, not to monopolize the, monopolize, monopolize the market, but uh, uh, we wanted to, to distribute them to everyone uh, free of uh, charge and we will uh, construct two new hospitals in Istanbul in maximum 45 uh, days. And our fight against COVID-19 is uh, praised overall by WHO and recently reiterated by Director General uh, Dr. Tedros. We also uh, took measures to mitigate the adverse social and economic uh, effects of the pandemic uh, and our priority is preventing job uh, losses and keeping production uh, uh, base intact and tax reduction on various sectors including tourism and aviation, credit and interest payments for businesses and uh, SMEs uh, postponed, financial assistance provided for uh, exporters, more than three million dollars uh, of financial assistance to uh, households. And we granted actually export license, as I said, to 34 uh, countries for personal protective uh, equipment. And we actually have uh, received requests from 104 countries uh, so far. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot meet uh, their demands. I mean, all of their demands, but now we are uh, currently ranked third globally among the countries that have provided the most aid. Uh, right after China and the United States. And we redoubled our efforts to increase uh, production. Hopefully we will be able to supply more to other countries uh, as well. On the other hand, the struggle uh, and even fight for medical equipment worldwide harms uh, mutual trust among the uh, countries. We, are, we regret to see that. And this is a global uh, pandemic and we need a global effort and uh, solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Ali Bey? Yes, Mr. Minister, on behalf of Turkish Heritage Organization, I also would like to say thank you for your time. Uh, our question is, even in midst of worthwhile effort, 
to combat the spread of COVID-19. There is already a sense of blame invoked some nations for not doing more. How do you see different countries' responses, especially regarding international cooperation and from the angle of a post-COVID world? How will the world system be affected in regards to globalization or multilateralization versus deglobalization and unilateralization? Thank you. Ali Bey, thank you very much for your question and good to see you again, uh, uh, this time virtually. And I don't want to make comment about the measures that other countries uh, take or their uh, capacity, but it is clear that uh, many countries at the beginning uh, didn't take uh, coronavirus into account uh, seriously. Uh, we have to admit that uh, we are certainly going through one of the turning points of history. Many things will be different in the post-COVID uh, uh, war. Different projections, predictions, People now talk about our world uh, that is less open, less uh, prosperous, and less free. An era of strong nation states, increased tensions between the United States and China, maybe even Russia, and increase in conflicts. Some also argue uh, an end of the uh, globalization. I don't believe so, personally. Uh, globalization is there, and the pandemic itself is proof of how we became interconnected and uh, interdependent. The pandemic actually uh, speeds up ongoing trends, uh, end of a, a unipolar world, emergence of a new power centers, the rise of Asia, uh, rise in xenophobia, uh, anti-immigrant discourses, Islamophobia and antisemitism and etc., and rise of artificial intelligence and blockchain weakening of European project, uh, which we don't want, actually, we are part of Europe. Uh, therefore, we don't prefer that. And the pandemic is only uh, reshaping the geopolitics of globalization. And uh, it might be an Asia-centric globalization. And the pandemic can shock uh, all of us and force us into more multilateralism. And the global economy will uh, go into recession this year, this is for sure. Uh, and the downturn will be sudden and sharp. Unemployment uh, will uh, test all, including the wealthy nations. Again, what we need is more solidarity, more multilateralism, not isolation, populistic nationalist uh, discourses, and we should ensure the uh, flow of trade and increase the swap agreements, development banks and international funds should step in and we should restore global growth and um, maintain market uh, stability. And again, here G20 is key, like in 2008 global financial crisis, it should step in. And G20 leaders summit on 26 March uh, issued a strong declaration and implementation is, of course, this declaration is important. So teleconferences with some G20 nations and with other initiatives, Canada and others, we have been actually as Turkey also spending a lot of efforts that, uh, uh, that the solidarity uh, and also uh, global uh, efforts uh, should uh, be uh, more important. And it is actually, they are more important than ever at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Um, Mr. Minister, international organizations have also been heavily criticized for their responses to COVID-19. NATO, however, has been quite active in offering and providing assistance to its member states. Can you briefly fill us in on NATO's role and coordination with its members and allies, allied nations to combat the spread of the COVID-19? Thank you, Mr. Minister. Devtan, thank you very much uh, for your question. I forgot to say that uh, it's such a pleasure to see you again. Likewise, and, you know, uh, we can only eradicate this uh, threat through collective effort. This is what I have been trying to emphasize several times uh, since we started. NATO, as the most successful security uh, alliance ever, uh, should play a really leading role. And this is what we have been discussing at uh, many summits and uh, ministerials, actually. NATO should adapt itself to the uh, new realities. 
And uh, this was the message we all expressed during the NATO foreign ministers that I mentioned again. And NATO's uh, Euro-Atlantic Disaster Response Coordination Center has so far uh, done a good job in coordinating and mobilizing uh, the assistance among uh, allies. And we are determined to do our uh, utmost to uh, help our allies and partners in these uh, trying times donations to Italy, Spain, and UK, as I mentioned, and export permits to uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, and donations to Balkan allies and partners like Albania, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as uh, Serbia. And Turkey uh, was the first uh, to use uh, the NATO's new response activity named as rapid air uh, mobility. Uh, during uh, its assistance to uh, UK uh, recently. And we believe NATO uh, will continue to be one of the most effective uh, platforms and it will emerge even stronger after uh, the pandemic is uh, over. I can say that so far NATO actually proved that uh, it is a, a strong uh, alliance. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. Minister, another question is about Syria. How has the continued increased conflict in Idlib, the flow of refugees from Syria, impacted Turkey at this time during the pandemic? What will Turkey's role be moving forward in this conflict? Thank you very much. Uh, Ali Bey, uh, we have been repeatedly saying that we are hosting 3.6 million uh, Syrians in Turkey. Actually, uh, we are responsible altogether uh, for 9 million Syrians in Turkey and the Syrians uh, in Syria, IDPs or local uh, people. And humanitarian situation uh, in and around Idlib and in many parts of Syria, uh, actually not very good. And in Idlib, it was already uh, green before the pandemic and regimes in discriminate attacks uh, uh, displace millions and mostly women and children, vulnerable people. And the pandemic worsened, of course, the situation and they now have to survive in overcrowded camps or bombed uh, buildings uh, where social uh, distancing or physical distancing, uh, as I said, uh, like uh, medical, uh, you know, uh, and isolation, uh, you know, are hard uh, to practice uh, in Idlib uh, region. Uh, you know, uh, some of the uh, IDPs, thanks to ceasefire, went back to their homes, but not so many because the fear is still there. And the regime, uh, at the other hand, destroyed vital infrastructure like medical uh, facilities in, uh, in, in, in Syria. Under these circumstances, uh, tackling the pandemic is uh, very difficult, frankly speaking. And Turkey is the main source and artery for the cross-border humanitarian assistance. We have been working with UN agencies and also uh, humanitarian uh, organizations. And the COVID-19 makes these relief efforts even more uh, difficult. And we are concerned that this might trigger another wave of refugees to Turkey. Uh, due to the, uh, you know, international community's failure, unfortunately, around 1.5 million Syrians are at our uh, doorstep uh, at this moment. And we cannot handle, obviously, a new wave uh, from Idlib or elsewhere. Uh, it's not only about the capacity or uh, the burden, but this will bring additional health uh, risk uh, as well. An international community must uh, act before it is too late for Syria and Idlib. And Idlib uh, desperately needs more foreign assistance and a solid international uh, response plan, which we don't uh, have right now. And this ceasefire of March 5th in Idlib holds, despite occasional uh, violations, it is crucial to maintain it uh, as it will facilitate efforts to fight uh, a positive COVID-19 outbreak, uh, when uh, well, we need actually concrete and timely and unconditional support uh, from our allies, first and foremost, uh, the United States, 
uh, so far we have re uh, received strong uh, support uh, from United States in words, but we need to see this uh, in practice uh, as well. And the only viable way out to this conflict uh, is a political process in the line with the UN Security Council Resolution 2254. And uh, we should go back to Geneva for the continu uh, continuation of the uh, actual Constitution Committee uh, meetings. Uh, unfortunately, after the second meeting, uh, that committee uh, couldn't uh, uh, gather until uh, today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. Actually, we want to go a bit deeper on the issues that you just touched, uh, and thank you for flagging them. Uh, maybe, uh, do you expect any change uh, in the UN structure or UN uh, Security Council structure uh, following this pandemic, sir? You know, just could you elaborate on that a bit? Thank you. I think everybody uh, agrees that UN Security Council uh, has been late to respond uh, to COVID-19. Uh, they met to discuss the pandemic almost four months after the outbreak. This is unbelievable, outrageous. In fact, the Security Council has failed to address the other international conflicts uh, properly, uh, as in the case of uh, Syria. Uh, you know, Syria is only one of them. Look at Libya, Yemen, and the others. And its structure needs to be adapted to the global challenges as well. Turkey is a strong advocate of the Security Council reform. And as President Erdogan repeatedly underlines, the world is bigger than uh, five. And uh, obviously, we have to also admit that UN Security Council uh, is not inclusive, neither inclusive, uh, nor representative. That said, we welcome, of course, the efforts of the Secretary General and these steps were taken in the right directions, the, like the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, the Response and Recovery Fund for the least developed and low middle income countries, and the call for a global uh, ceasefire. And so far, UN General Assembly adopted two resolutions, and Turkey, by the way, co-sponsored both of them, and they were also in the right uh, direction. And still, you know, despite all this criticism to United Nations or other uh, international and regional organizations, the UN's efforts are a vital for uh, so many vulnerable groups and conflict uh, regions. Uh, I just mentioned some of them. And uh, we don't have a better tool at the hand at this moment, and we should do our best uh, to support it. But uh, we, at the same time, we should actually uh, intensify our efforts uh, to reform this uh, umbrella organization uh, and its institutions, uh, particularly the UN Security Council, as you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Minister, another question is, you recently published an article in an international newspaper criticizing the EU's inaction on Idlib. Remind that the Turkey Syrian border is also the southeast boundaries of European Union and NATO. Can you inform us where we are with the EU and Turkey relations? Well, Ali Bey, uh, it's a long story. Uh, you know, uh, it has been how many years? More than 60 years uh, that uh, we officially applied for a membership. Uh, in during the uh, last uh, leadership, I mean previous leadership, and the European Parliament, unfortunately, uh, not because what happened in Turkey, also because of the uh, trends and developments uh, within the uh, European Union and its institutions, uh, our dialogue uh, was not uh, satisfactory with the European Union. But after the change of, in the leadership of the European Union, high-level contacts have increased since last year. And President Erdogan visited Brussels on March 9th. And we had frank discussions, actually, on uh, March 18 agreement and overall Turkish-EU relations. And uh, President Michel uh, was in Turkey uh, two times. And Turkish and EU leaders decided to begin an exercise on or, um, 
converging our uh, differences. We still have uh, differences. And uh, I uh, and uh, High Representative Borrell are uh, jointly leading uh, the work uh, to this, uh, on these issues. And we are in constant uh, contact with the uh, leadership right now, as well as Borrell and the new enlargement commissioner. And our trade minister has been in uh, contact with her counterparts, I mean, commissioner uh, for trade. I hope this pandemic will uh, encourage more strategic thinking uh, on the side of the European Union. And as Turkey, we always say, we need Europe, European Union, and European Union needs Turkey. Unfortunately, uh, it is increasingly becoming, uh, I mean, this organization, EU, uh, becoming hostage uh, to uh, xenophobia, racism, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. And the uh, body organizations like uh, European Parliament uh, have been very much uh, polarized. Uh, instead of uh, the core values, you know, ideologies have been actually dominating uh, this uh, organization. And with regards to uh, and the, our cooperation in Syria and uh, the refugees in Turkey, you know, we have uh, uh, reached an understanding in 2016. As Turkey, we have honored our obligation until today. Um, but unfortunately, for many reasons, European Union uh, couldn't do that. Now we are working how to revitalize this, but our relations with the European Union is not limited with the uh, refugee or our cooperation on uh, migration or uh, refugees. Uh, we have uh, cooperation in many other areas. I forget about the uh, enlargement and negotiations, uh, but also uh, visa liberalization and modernization of the custom unions agreement and counterterrorism and so on and so on. Therefore, uh, at this critical moment, I think uh, we should uh, be more visionary to first create a more positive atmosphere in our uh, relations and then uh, to continue our cooperation in a result-oriented uh, manner and in it should, it should be a genuine cooperation. Did I answer your question fully, Ali Bey? It was a long question. No, it was great. Thank you for the response, Minister. Um, Mr. Minister, if I can jump in quick, this, we, we, we have so many questions to ask. Um, and uh, I'd like to jump on again uh, back to uh, S4, actually to Idlib and uh, S400. Uh, issue, uh, Turkey's purchase of S400 has created a lot of debate in the United States, including in Congress, and the issue seems to be the main point of discord and obstacle in bilateral relationship. I want to link this issue to the situation in Idlib as well. For, for a while now, Turkey has been asking for support from the United States and NATO against attacks in the area. Recently, U.S. Ambassador to NATO Kay Bailey Hutchison said that the United States is ready to assist Turkey in Idlib. If Ankara rejects the S-400 missile system, how do you comment on, your, on the U.S. approach and the fact that the situation in Idlib is linked to the S-400 missile system? On the other hand, uh, recently President Erdogan had also said that uh, it would be, uh, the system would, can be turned, up, turned on in April. Will it become an op operational soon, or is there a calendar uh, still under debate? I really appreciate your answers. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Well, uh, thank you for uh, your question. First of all, uh, it is not appropriate to put preconditions when an ally uh, is uh, in need, an urgent need, like happened in uh, Italy. And all the allies, and the mainly United States, uh, recognized and appreciated what Turkey did to stop the bloodshed. But Turkey needed the support of uh, NATO as also as well as uh, the uh, member states, I mean, allies uh, support. And uh, we need advanced missiles and air defense system to protect our people. And it's a, it's, this is also a long story. And the ballistic threat that Turkey faces is real because even the regime has the missiles in Syria. And it is 
Uh, this fact is accepted uh, by everyone, including the United States and uh, NATO. And Turkey's decision to purchase the S-400 system is a result of U.S. Uh, reluctance to meet our urgent needs for many years, for 10 years old. And this is also acknowledged by President uh, Trump. Our uh, previous attempts to purchase Patriot system were inconclusive. And the Congress, unfortunately, yes, I can understand their uh, frustration and the reaction, but the Congress played a, ne a negative role in, in that respect. And we are ready to purchase Patriots if uh, we have a good offer. And our stance on the resolution of S-400 issue has not changed. We offer the U.S. to establish a technical working uh, group with NATO's inclusion. And NATO can lead this uh, technical working group, uh, actually. And this offer is still on the uh, table. So uh, Turkey will never put uh, the integrity of the NATO defense uh, system uh, at risk. This also includes the uh, F-35 uh, program, of which Turkey is a, a founding partner, and we have already uh, spent $1.35 billion for F-35 uh, program. At the end, uh, what I am trying to say that uh, we had to buy S-400s uh, air defense system just because we couldn't uh, purchase them, uh, purchase those kind of system from our allies for uh, last uh, 10 years. And in the future, we need more air defense system. And uh, if our allies can provide, it doesn't have to be only Patriot from United States, it can be also actually SAMTI uh, of Eurosum. This is a, a joint venture of uh, Spain, uh, sorry, uh, France and uh, Italy, uh, or any, any uh, similar system from other allies. And we prefer to uh, purchase from our allies. If not, I have to seek alternatives. So this is uh, my answer to your uh, question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Minister, uh, follow up to Defne Hanım's question. Uh, Turkey-Russia relations. So Turkey and Russia have important relations. They are very close in many areas such as energy and trade, but they have also tense relationship regarding the situation in Syria. So many experts believe the current ceasefire difficult to sustain. And experts and politicians in the United States are presenting Turkey in such a way that the country has a choice to make between Russia and United States. So how do you comment on this? Do you believe there is a choice to make? Well, first, uh, Ali Bey, uh, no countries in our region has to make a choice between this country and that country. And we should all balance our relations with everybody. Russia, we have to admit this, is our neighbor and a very important actor in our uh, region. So it is natural to cooperate with Moscow, although it is not always easy, as you also uh, mentioned. Our bilateral relations are multidimensional. Um, our energy, trade, and tourism cooperation are mutually uh, beneficial. And we also try to have constructive relations on regional issues, especially on Syria and Libya. Our cooperation can be instrumental in conflict resolution. And that's why Astana process has been effective. And that's why, actually, we were able to uh, have a, uh, announced a ceasefire together with Russia in Istanbul. Clearly, we don't agree on everything with Russia, and we do not uh, shy away from expressing our uh, disagreements, like Ukraine, Crimea, Georgia, Syria, and sometimes even in Libya. And we work with Russia where and when it is possible, but when necessary, we stand firm. That's why from time to time, there uh, could be some uh, tensions. On the other hand, Turkey is a NATO member and the United States is our most important ally. Our cooperation with the US on uh, various issues and at different uh, geographies are vital, including uh, Afghanistan. Let me be clear, uh, Ali Bey, Turkey's uh, broader strategic direction has not uh, altered. A change of access does not make sense uh, to us because we are in this region at the center of the uh, axis. 
and Turkey's long-standing Euro-Atlantic orientation and its relationship with uh, Russia are not uh, mutually exclusive. To be, uh, to be more precise, again, uh, we don't see ourselves as having to make a choice between the US and uh, Russia. Uh, by the way, uh, yes, we have been cooperating with Russia in Syria and Libya, but we have never been on, on the sa uh, same side with uh, on the same side with uh, uh, Russia. Uh, but some of the allies are, sh uh, are shoulder by shoulder with Russia. I mean, in Libya, they are not on the ground uh, fighting shoulder by shoulder, shoulder but uh, like France, they both of them are supporting Haftar. And they are at the same side, neither in uh, Libya or nor in Syria, uh, Turkey and Russia uh, uh, have been uh, at the same side, we, we have been at different sides, but we took the advantage of being at uh, different sides actually to uh, bring uh, at least, uh, not peace, but at least to maintain ceasefire and to calm uh, the uh, situation in, in both countries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Minister, since you uh, have flagged Libya, uh, in, on one of your press briefings, again, you have said that Libyan military commander uh, Khalifa Haftar is seeking a military solution to the lingering conflict in the country. Uh, is there any progress in this conflict, uh, especially after the Berlin summit? Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic regarding uh, resolution of this conflict, Mr. Minister? Well, uh, the Berlin conference, Lefnanum, was an important uh, step to stabilize the situation in Libya. However, uh, Haftar intensified his military campaign after the conference, and his forces are targeting mostly civilians and civilian uh, infrastructures. Uh, we were, uh, are we su surprised? No, we were expecting that. Why? Because in Moscow, Haftar refrained to sign the uh, peace uh, agreement or ceasefire agreement, actually. But the legitimate government and its leader, Saraj, signed the uh, document in Moscow. And in uh, Berlin, nobody was able to convince Haftar to express his support to the joint communique of Berlin conference. He, nobody was able to convince him even to bring to the chancellery of uh, Germany and he stayed at his hotel. And even uh, the latest call for a humanitarian post to cope with the pandemic uh, didn't stop Haftar. So uh, they, they continue to shelling uh, of Tripoli, uh, targeting civilians, uh, block the oil flow, and uh, drop revenues for medical and personal uh, protection equipment, cut essential water and power supplies in Tripoli, so there can be no military solution. Haftar has to understand that, or somebody has to convince Haftar that in Libya, there will be no military solution. Only the solution is the political one. And it must be Libyan-led and Libyan-owned. This is the principle that uh, we uh, support. And international community should actually put pressure uh, on Haftar, as I said, and its uh, supporter, uh, his supporter. Uh, like uh, UAE, Egypt, and Russia has, you know, this company over there, and France, I have to add, from Europe, and the Haftar, Haftar at the end has to hold the military campaign, lift the oil blockage, and agree on an official, and this time, a binding uh, a ceasefire uh, agreement, and that is only the way also to implement the uh, Berlin conference uh, conclusions. So uh, Turkey's involvement in the conflict uh, balanced the power on the ground. It is uh, thanks to uh, Turkey's involvement that Berlin process is still alive. And uh, as Turkey, we will continue to support UN-backed legitimate uh, government of Libya. Again, only the solution is the political one. But the reason that Haftar is not uh, agreeing uh, the political solution or Haftar is not for political solution is that Haftar doesn't want to share the power in Libya and he wants to get all the power uh, through uh, military uh, campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Mr. Minister, another hot topic is energy in the region. So Turkey has sent two drilling ships to explore for gas in waters of island of Cyprus. So what needs to be done to have a solution in the Eastern Mediterranean? Is Turkey willing to reach a compromise with Greece? Well, uh, Ali Bey, why we came to this point, that point? How? And, uh, you know, we have been asking uh, European Union, UN, even Greece, uh, that uh, Greek Cypriots uh, shouldn't contact, have, have, shouldn't have contacted uh, actually uh, any kind of activities, drilling or exploitation activities uh, at the Eastern Mediterranean before the, they reach an uh, agreement on equitable revenue sharing. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't uh, happen. So there are two aspects of these issues. Uh, delimitation of maritime boundaries, first. And secondly, legitimate and equal rights of the Turkish Cypriots on the natural resources uh, of the uh, island. And we keep suggesting a new dialogue on the Eastern Mediterranean at the highest level with Greece. President Erdogan himself actually uh, proposed uh, Prime Minister Mishotakis in London on the occasion of NATO leaders meeting. Uh, but Greece uh, uh, pr uh, prefers to uh, lobby against Turkey's legitimate rights in the region instead of answering our calls for uh, sincere uh, dialogue. For uh, regional stability, the uh, main focus uh, should be bringing uh, two sides together uh, on the island for a uh, equitable uh, revenue uh, sharing. And the proposal of uh, Turkish Cypriot authorities represents the only reasonable and realistic uh, base for a solution. Turkish Cypriots proposed to establish a commission uh, for a equitable revenue sharing, which is uh, fair enough, uh, because the Greek Cypriots don't want to sign any kind of agreement with Turkish Cypriots, it means for Greek Cypriots uh, the recognition of the Turkish uh, Cypriot state, or Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, I mean. And we expect international community to encourage Greek Cypriots to talk to Turkish Cypriots. And Greek Cypriots shouldn't act as the sole owner of the island. And this is the reason of the tension uh, at this moment at the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. And EU measures actually they have taken some measures against us and do not uh, contribute those measures do not contribute to the solution uh, only encourage greek cypriots to move further away uh, from this uh, solution and hydrocarbon activities uh, will continue now we have the third drilling ship kanuni and we may send it if it is needed to the region uh, you know and uh, we are open at the end, Ali Bey, for dialogue with all countries. We have been uh, repeatedly underlining this. All countries for the maritime uh, boundaries uh, delimitation, of course, except Greek Cypriots, because we don't recognize them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Minister, we discussed a lot of uh, issues and time is not enough, uh, but and also a lot of conflicts in the region as well. Uh, do you expect uh, the coronavirus outbreak to affect uh, the efforts for a peaceful resolu resolution of the conflict, sir? Well, I tried to explain this in my opening uh, remarks, and the pandemics will, of course, affect, uh, you know, uh, conflict uh, regions uh, even more. It can also uh, limit the international interest in solving conflicts because uh, the priorities uh, now are uh, totally uh, different than the priorities uh, three, four months ago. And at times like this, each country tends to focus on its own domestic situation. I can understand that. Uh, however, we should maintain the momentum to resolve uh, conflicts uh, peacefully. Uh, this coronavirus uh, will be uh, over today or tomorrow. Uh, but if we cannot resolve these conflicts, the impacts of these conflicts might be tremendous uh, globally. And conflict resolution uh, and mediation is indeed uh, one of the major uh, pillars of our enterprising and uh, humanitarian uh, policy. And we launched the Mediation for Peace Initiative together with uh, Finland at the uh, UN uh, a decade ago. 
uh, now the group of friends of mediation has around uh, i think 60 uh, members and we also co-chair the groups of friends of mediation at the OECE as and, and at the organization of islamic uh, cooperation and we organize annual mediation conference uh, in the autumn uh, i hope we will be uh, able to uh, actually convene that conference uh, this autumn as well and the mediation for peace certificate program for young diplomats if we cannot organize this program i mean physically maybe we can uh, ha can have an open program that young diplomats from all over the world can reach meanwhile uh, we will of course continue uh, educating the mediators uh, not only mediators of the Islamic countries, but also uh, the other mediators of other countries. And uh, the program has been very attractive. We should continue that. And we will continue to use all these platforms and mechanisms to uh, raise awareness and capacity uh, for uh, peaceful uh, resolution of uh, all the conflicts, not only the conflicts in our region, but uh, the conflicts beyond as well, beyond our region as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Minister, before we close up, uh, it's the last question. Does the pandemic affect diplomacy in your opinion, especially interaction on digital platforms? Well, no doubt that the outbreak uh, affects diplomacy as well. It limits traditional face-to-face -face, uh, interaction many summits, meetings, and e events are canceled or uh, postponed to another time. Several important meetings uh, have just uh, moved uh, to online platforms. Uh, President Erdogan hosted the summit on Syria with leaders of Germany, France, and uh, United Kingdom uh, in a video conference. Uh, by the way, I'm very happy that Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, has recovered and uh, we were concerned but uh, thank god he has uh, recovered and g20 leaders met online with uh, the very uh, first time and i attended the first ever virtual nato foreign ministers meeting as i mentioned before uh, these are unprecedented uh, developments Alibi. and we also witness uh, the emergence of a coronavirus diplomacy every day i speak at least uh, 10 colleagues of different countries or representatives of uh, different international and regional uh, organizations. And some countries are getting together to discuss and align their uh, pandemic response. For example, uh, we led the way for a formation of a senior official coordination group in uh, G20. And the outbreak has reminded us uh, the transformative uh, effect of new technologies, as you mentioned, Alibi. Uh, learning the skills to adapt uh, to this transformation is very important, not only important, crucial. And I announced our Digital Diplomacy Initiative last year at our annual ambassadors conference. We also wanted to organize Antalya Diplomacy Forum uh, under the theme of diplomacy in the digital age. You were also uh, invited. However, because of the pandemic, we postponed it to a further date. And the pandemic has actually uh, reconfirmed that our digital uh, diplomacy initiative, initiative uh, was uh, indeed very uh, timely. And we are now uh, studying the ways for further uh, incorporate digital tools uh, to diplomacy. And we are also uh, identifying the necessary digital skills uh, for our diplomats. And personally, I, uh, I have been busier than ever, I have to say. But uh, since there is no traveling, I have been also saving some, uh, uh, some uh, time for myself and my uh, family as well. So improving my other skills. You know, I grew up in a farm, my father's farm. So uh, I have been working also at the garden uh, in, uh, during the weekends, uh, particularly, and looking forward to going to my hometown, Antalya, and the, the spring is there, the fruits and vegetables are very fresh and organic. So uh, what I'm trying to say, we have been very busy, 
but also saving time because there is no uh, traveling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I would like to take this time to thank you for taking the time to join us for this timely conversation. Uh, we uh, believe that it was a very productive conversation and our audience also enjoyed. Uh, as a Turkish heritage organization, we continue to foster the relationship between two NATO allies, and we are stronger with allies, of course. And also I'd like to thank you, the Atlantic Council, for their continued partnership and alliance with our organization. We deeply value the work of Atlantic Council and Atlantic Council of Turkey and look forward to our continuing partnership. Our joint panel is live streamed, but also will be available on the websites and the YouTube channels of both Atlantic Council and THO. And we'd like to thank you again. And Defne will be making the closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Ali Bey. Uh, you know, just as you said, it is wonderful to be cooperating with you. Thank you for to you and your team, Turkish Heritage Organization. Mr. Minister, it was an honor to host you today. Uh, and uh, and thank you for enlightening us uh, and answering all our questions, you know, patiently. And we do hope to, uh, you know, host you at some other occasion, uh, hopefully soon and live, uh, instead of virtual. And hopefully the COVID-19 will be over soon for, whole the, for all the globe. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to Atlantic Council and also Turkish Heritage Organization. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Enjoyed. And Thank you. And I'd like to thank the audience for joining as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.